Hello, everybody. <laughs> this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this uh, Wednesday night Bible study for the Church of the Eternally Secure. Uh, with me tonight is uh, Brother Jason Cripps and Brother uh, Stephen, a uh, soldier for Christ. We are at war. Um, I, I'm sad to report to everybody that Sister Renee will not be with us. Uh, as far as I know, she's still in the hospital tonight. Uh, I'm going to ask everybody to keep praying for her. And she's uh, in a horrible pain. And let's pray that uh, you can get the right medicine or surgery or whatever is needed. Whatever kind of treatment is needed. And, of course, we'll ask the Lord to give us some miraculous healing. That would be something, wouldn't it? Could, it would be, wouldn't it be wonderful we could celebrate a miracle? Amen. Yeah. Uh, okay, so before we get started, uh, we, we are in the book of Romans, uh, working our way through there. We're tonight going to start with Romans chapter 4, verse 11. But before we get into that, let me ask, uh, I already asked Alex. Let's see, we got uh, Journey Journey's Wake. Uh, anybody in there has a wrench. Uh, we've got a lot of trolls in here tonight. So I'm going to ask you to get rid of them as fast as you can. Do not dialogue with them. Don't think that there's any chance of communicating with them. As soon as they uh, come in there with that uh, their fart uh, uh, gospel, let's uh, let's get rid of them. Get rid of them fast as you can, please, Hendrix and, and Alex and anybody else who can help us out. I won't be able to monitor it myself, so please do that for us. Okay, so before we get into the scriptures, let me ask, uh, okay, Brother Stephen, why don't you go first? Introduce yourself to anybody who might not know you. Hello, I am Steve. My channel name is Soldier for Christ. We are at war. That's S O U L J A four. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, uh, S O U L J A, the number four, not spelled out. Christ, we are at war. Um, so yeah, that's my channel name. I have one video uh, on the gospel. It's an hour and 17 minutes long. If you haven't watched it, watch it and subscribe and click the bell because eventually here soon I'm going to start putting out more videos. Uh, pray for me that uh, God allows me to find the time to do that. And um, I'm glad to be here tonight. Thanks for having me, Brother Luke, and good to be on the panel again with Jason and Luke at the same time. It's wonderful. Amen. Okay. Uh, all right, Brother Jason, will you introduce yourself? And I'm trying to post the first scripture in there, the chat room, but um, it's too long. It won't accept it all. Let me see. And split it up if you want. I'm, I'm Jason Cripps, and my channel is True Story Live. Uh, of course, a lot of the people that are regulars in here, they, they know that. But uh, for the playback purposes, uh, that's my channel. Um, I also am uh, very happy to be here. And um, uh, obviously, we're all concerned about Renee. I just wanted to mention something about that. Um, do uh, please keep her in your prayers. Uh, she would be here if she could. Amen. And uh, with all the stuff going on with her, we just uh, pray um, healing for her miraculous healing, as Brother Luke had mentioned. And uh, we know that God loves her more than we do. And though we do love her, uh, we can pray for her and uh, hope that she is on the mend and uh, gets back home soon so she can join us here. So we miss her. and uh, But we're glad to have all of you in the chat room that are regulars and anyone new. Uh, introduce yourself and and be welcomed by the people in the, in the chat. Um, all right. Thanks, guys, and uh, for those of that are on troll uh, duty, appreciate you uh, doing that as well. So thanks for that. Okay, uh, thank you. And uh, yeah, I was surprised that, that that one verse eleven. I had to split it up into two parts. Uh, it looks like uh, Brother Cripps and Brother Steve are not going to have access to uh, the scripture except looking at the chat room for it. So I'm going to post them there as we go along. Um, but let me, let me begin. Uh, first of all, let me see if there's any context needed from last time. I'll, I'll read the verse and then, uh, okay. It says, 
this, of course, this is the Apostle Paul writing in the uh, book of Romans, chapter 4, verse 11. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had yet been uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe, though they not though they be not cir circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed unto them also. Okay, uh, so I'll give you a little bit of context before I ask you to respond to it. Uh, uh, in the previous study, we finished up with the uh, verses, you know, 8, 9, and 10, where he, uh, Paul is giving an account of uh, Abraham, how he was saved by faith, but he had not been circumcised yet. And he was saved before he was circumcised. So uh, this is to make the case, I think, that um, Abraham's salvation was based entirely on faith alone uh, without before he had done any work. And the first work, of course, that people could, could argue is needed is circumcision. Another work that they point to in Abraham is the... Uh, the willingness for him to sacrifice his son that happens later in Abraham's life. But uh, Paul's making the point here that uh, he was saved or justified by his son before he was circumcised. So uh, do you guys want to go in any particular order? Or you want to take turns going first? Do you have any preference? I, I don't have a preference. And uh, just, uh, St uh, Steve, are you able to see that I copied and pasted from, from the app, the scripture? Are you able to look at that? Um, Steve? Okay. Yes. So, but yes. <laughs> you, you're able to see it? Yes. Yes. Okay. Th uh, thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, uh, I said the question is, uh, do you want me to just uh, call on you, uh, or do you want uh, to go in the same order each time, or me alternate it? Do you have any preference? Uh, let Steve, why don't Steve go first, and then I'd love to follow Steve up if, if you want to do that, do it that way. Okay, Steve, I'm going to call on you first, and then we'll get to Brother Chris's thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> the pressure. Okay, so, the pressure. Right, the pressure. Steve, uh, verse, verse 11. I gave you the basic context of that. Please amplify your thoughts for us. Woo! Um, yeah! Amplification. Um, I wonder how it reads in the Amplified. But uh, He's, he's going to read it in the Amplified, Steve. Nice! I nice. love the Amplified because it does, what it, it does what it says. Yep. It really does. Um, so, circumcision was a sign... The Abraham, wait a minute. Did, did you post that? Yeah, uh, verse 11 is what, uh, uh, Romans 4, verse 11. Was that King James? Yeah, it no. is King James. Is yes. it? Okay. Yeah, I posted it, I, I'll post it in King James in the in the uh, chat room for you. That you can see it, isn't it? Can you see I, the chat room, Steve? Yeah, no, he, well, I see what um, I see what uh, you posted, Jason. That's not King James. <laughs> Did I have it on the wrong version? Yeah, I posted. I posted. That's okay. I okay. That's okay. Oh, I, I know okay. why. I know why. Steve, can you see the part <laughs> that I posted? Steve, no. I posted in the KJV, so look for no. that. I, but got, me, I can't see that. That's what we're trying to tell I got you. It. I'm over. I flip flopped over to my Bible app. So um, okay. Let me let me read now. it in the amplified. I'm going to read it in the amplified since you want to okay. hear that, and then I'll get your thoughts on it. Okay, so okay, here's the sounds good. verse eleven says, "He received the sign of circumcision, a seal or confirmation of the righteousness which he had by faith, while he was still uncircumcised. This was so that he would be the spiritual father of all who believe." Being believe without being circumcised so that righteousness would come. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, that reminds me of the verse that uh, uh, talks about the seal of the Holy Spirit. And I believe that that's what the, that, that 
that is what this is really referring to, uh, the sign of circumcision, because he wasn't yet circumcised in the flesh. He was, so he, if he got the seal or the sign of circumcision prior to circumcision, it would have to be a spiritual circumcision. Uh, you know, uh, we often talk about the the regeneration of of the spirit, the being born again concept that when that happens, God takes our heart of stone and turns it into a heart of fle flesh that is, you know, moldable to his purposes. And, and you know, uh, that's where I believe that is when God sanctifies us with his imputed righteousness that um, was prepared for from the begin from the foundation of the world by by uh, by Christ knowing he would come to the earth and, and die but also the fact that he was uh, revelation says he was slain from the foundation of the world and the works were finished before the foundation of the world and that was Christ's work not ours and because Abraham believed it his his heart was circumcised uh, a seal of the righteousness of, of faith that comes that righteousness that is of faith of believing it's why you know in the previous verses uh, it talks about um, you know the fact that we are imputed to be imputed with the righteousness of God and not having our sins imputed on us um, which were imputed on on Jesus on the cross and if we believe that he gives us his righteousness so um, but I, I, I definitely think that this is a spiritual thing especially since how can you be circumcised before you're circumcised <laughs> it's the only way to to really to explain that and because of that he became the father of all those that would believe uh, in the same manner in which he believed which was and received the righteousness of God that was imputed unto him was by faith that's why he's our father in in, in the in that sense because we follow that example of by faith we get the imputed righteousness of God Hmm. Okay. Um, Brother Cripps? Yeah. Uh, I think Steve covered it pretty well, but I'll just, I'll just add. So um, Abraham was, uh, had the imputed righteousness. I mean, it's stated very clearly in the Bible before he was ever uh, physically circumcised. And for me, this is yet another example of it being circumcision of the heart rather than just circumcision of the body. The actual uh, physical circumcision is an outward sign of what's happening internally. I mean, in, in, you know, before the cross, for sure. And uh, it's just more proof how God works with us, even, even before the cross, of it being a heart thing, an internal thing, and not an external thing. And just the very fact that people for the longest time still thought about the, the physical act of it being what was necessary, it's very clear to me from this passage that it, it was the internal part first. And also it is God that gives it and not something we do for or to ourselves. That's the, that's the point I wanted to make uh, as far as that's concerned. But uh, good stuff. Mm -hmm. All right. All uh right. I'm not hearing any uh, feedback, so, so far, I don't think it's going to be necessary for us to mute when we're not talking, and that'll save us some time trying to click on and off. If we do hear any feedback, uh, then we'll have to start uh, being attentive to that, but uh, we're talking about, I tried to give a little bit of context before we started, but I think that, uh, let me actually give you the actual context and go back. And let's look at the verses. We're on verse 11, but let me begin with uh, 
verse 8. It says, Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. So uh, Stephen and Brother Cripps were both talking about this concept of sin being imputed, our sin being imputed to Jesus, Jesus' righteousness being imputed to us. So there it is. Mm -hmm. uh, but in verse 9, it says, Cometh this blessedness then upon the circumcision only, there's going to be a question mark here. Cometh this blessedness then upon the circumcision only or upon the uncircumcision also? So again, we know Paul asks a lot of questions to make you think and also sometimes to play the advocate for the false teachers to show you a contrast. But then he says, for we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. So Here's the key. We talk about the context that is important in studying the Bible. Uh, but context, uh, it can, can be very narrow or can be very broad. We, we've got the context of the previous verse and the following verse. Uh, obviously, the more before and after you read, the more context you're going to get. And it'll, it'll probably make more sense if you study that way. But we've also got the context of the the book itself and the writer and the subject, the, the audience. And in this book of Romans, and I can say that probably in, um, I don't know if I can say all, but in many of Paul's epistles, this is the glasses you've got to put on as you read it, read it through this lens. And then it'll make a lot more sense to you. Paul has this distinguished role in the church and in church history of being the apostle that chips away all of the excess and leaves us with this essential. And that is that we must understand and believe that we're saved by faith alone, in Christ alone. And if you add anything else to this as a formula, faith in Jesus plus something you've got to do then you've ruined it, you've nullified it, you've made it of none effect, and uh, you followed from grace. So you must have this on as your glasses or your mindset, your perspective that you're bringing into the reading. Understand that is Paul's contribution to the church more than anything else. So what is he? how does that relate to what he's saying here? Well, he's going out of his way to make the point that he says uh, that he wants us to know that Abraham was justified before he got circumcised so that no one can think that the act of circumcision or the, the faithfulness to get circumcised as God told him to, that that did not contribute to his salvation. It wasn't by his uh, work of circumcision. Just like today, we want people to understand it's not the work of baptiz water baptism that saves you. He got circumcised after he believed. Today, we should get water baptized after we believe. But it's not the water baptism or the circumcision that saves mm -hmm. us. We get saved before, and we do that uh, follow-up as, as, as we're instructed, but not not required to do for salvation. Amen. So he says, for we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. How was it then reckoned? When he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? Now, look, Paul is not one to waste words. Paul is the most scholarly of all of the biblical writers. Um, maybe in the Old Testament, maybe Daniel, maybe somebody else was scholarly too. But at least in the New Testament, I say with confidence, Paul was the most scholarly of all the writers. And he knew how to put sentences together and, uh, and organize his thoughts. And he is going out of his way to make it very clear here that, look, I want you to understand that he was justified, considered righteous before he got circumcised. So you're not confused thinking that circumcision is what saved him. Uh, he said, but he says, no, it's not in circumcision. He was not reckoned righteous uh, in circumcision. He did. He was reckoned righteous before circumcision. And then we get to verse 11. So that's the context leading up to it. And then in verse 11, 
uh, I'll read the rest of this, verse 11 in the Amplified now. It says, he received the sign of circumcision. So what's the sign? And what does it mean by a sign? Circumcision is something you, you do after you believe as a sign for who? It's not a sign to yourself. It's not a sign to God. It's a sign to the public so that they can recognize that you as a one who's believed. In that time, it was circumcision that identified you as you're someone who's believing in the God of uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and had the, the promise and promised Savior to come. But, uh, and this is a seal of confirmation of the righteousness which he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. So again, I mean, this this should be, why is he going out of his way to make this point so clear? Because this is essential. This is that important in the gospel. Without this, you have a gospel that is has no saving value. Uh, and that this was so that he would be the spiritual father of all who believe without being circumcised, so that righteousness would be credited to them. Okay, so that's it. That we're caught up now with the scriptures. And before I go to the next verse, now that we've all had a chance to speak about verse 11, let me get any more thoughts you have on that. Uh, let's let I'm gonna alternate turns. Let's go with uh, Brother Cripps first this time. Oh, you want me to go over it again? I, I'm, asking, I'm just asking if you have any further thoughts after listening to Steve and me and anything else, anything else you want to add or uh, move on. I got you. Sure. I think that, that you made it uh, seem uh, pretty clear, the uh, delineation that is being made between what is physical and what is spiritual, and that uh, the Abraham, of course, went through the spiritual first, just like we go through the spiritual. And, of course, uh, after the cross, there's there's no other need for a physical circumcision except that if a person, or, or baptism for that matter, and I think you made it very clear that the spiritual one is what's important and that you, we're not saved by circumcision or baptism or any other thing. We're, we're saved only by what Christ did on the cross and his finished work and nothing else. There's no physical outward sign other than the gift of the Holy Spirit, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, which comes across in us as fruits. And, and that's the proof that people can see. I think that was a good point that you made, Luke, about uh, it's not a sign to us. It's not a sign for the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit knows who he indwells and who he doesn't. It is a sign outwardly toward the, the, the people that are witnesses. Mm -hmm. And that's how it plays out. I'd like, uh, the, your, I'd like to get your thoughts and Steve's thoughts on the premise that I'm, I'm, I'm laying that, look, we, we need to bring this to the table. As we're studying all of the Pauline epistles, let's keep this in the back of our mind as a foundational point that should apply to everything as we understand, as we're trying to interpret and understand all of Paul's writings. Keep in mind that principle that his role and his primary task is to clarify this gospel of faith alone. Uh, so uh, get your, your thoughts on that. As a, as a method of study that we need to always have that as a, uh, in the back of our mind as we're looking at each one of these verses. Mm, yeah, agreed. Faith alone. Steve? Uh, ab absolutely. And one thing that you talked about that um, I, I wanted to delve in just a little bit uh, deeper, um, the fact that... Uh, you know, Paul, Paul is, you know, just like you said, the, the one of the things that was specifically going on at that time and part of the reason he was addressing this specifically was because of the fact that the Jews were telling the Gentiles they needed to be circumcised to to go ahead and be and be truly saved. Like you, you mentioned, you know, people are saying that about water baptism today and um and Paul is is arguing against that and showing from he, he's t pointing them back to the Old Testament to show where Abraham was saved. And, uh, you know, that that goes against this Paul only ism that people teach that, you know, people were saved by grace and works in the Old Testament. And Paul here is clearly using the Old Testament to 
go against that logic. So to use the Old Testament and say it was grace plus works is not true. Uh, when you use that context, like you said there, um, uh, Luke, and, and the fact that uh, another thing to keep in mind here when you're studying what Paul is writing is he very often quotes Old Testament or nearly quotes Old Testament uh, in his writings. And when he wrote this, there was no New Testament yet. Amen. So the only Bible they had to use was the Old Testament, and that's what they were preaching the gospel from. Paul, Say it again. Peter, John, everybody that wrote p part of the New Testament that preached the gospel, the New Testament was not written yet. They were using the Old Testament to preach the gospel. There it is. The, the gospel of grace through faith, no works. And when you look at Paul's writings from that angle, and like what, what Luke was saying, that's why it's so important to know your your author and and the in the historicity of what you're uh, of what you're reading when it was written because a lot of that helps you to understand where they were coming from you know they weren't rewriting a new testament the new testament hadn't been written yet so when you understand that and you see how paul is using the old testament to prove that it's not by circumcision it's not by uncircumcision that were saved. It's Abraham was saved by faith prior to circumcision. So circumcision is nothing. It's faith mm. in God and what God promised he, that he said he would do, that you believe he's faithful to complete it. That's what Abraham had. And that's why God imputed the righteousness was because Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness mm -hmm. amen well said amen and uh i posted the next verse in the uh chat room there uh, verse uh, 12 i hope you can both see it there it's in the kjv so i'll read that and, and we'll we'll go on but uh, first let me thank the our uh the saints in the chat room who are helping us out Al alex and and uh hendrix especially it looks like you're uh, very busy uh, getting rid of the the trolls, uh, ugly things. So they're that they'll they'll give up when they realize that they're not affecting us and that uh, their their comments are instantaneously removed. So thank you and appreciate your help with that. Totally. the the next The next verse, uh, verse twelve, reads, "And the father of circumcision to them." who are not of the circumcision only, but who also walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham, which he had being yet uncircumcised. So uh, this time, uh, let me ask uh, Brother Cripps to, to uh, go first. I'll alternate so that Steve is not on the spot every time. I want Steve to be on the spot all the time. <laughs> I think he works better under pressure. It's just <laughs> uh, verse twelve is perfect. So, father of circumcision to them who are not of the circumcision only. Again, the key word here is faith. The faith of our father Abraham. So we go back to the Old Testament again. Uh, Steve's point was right on, right on task. Um, when Abraham was uh, encountered, uh, when God encountered Abraham before that. Uh, he he believed everything God told him, and it was given to him as righteousness. That's how it happened. He wasn't circumcised first. He didn't have to go to a nearby well and get baptized or nearby river and get baptized before he got the righteousness imputed on him by God himself. It was his faith that saved him before any New Testament was ever written. So it's said again here in, in verse 12, faith is the key word. It's the key word back then. It's still the key word. Faith is the only way that we come to Christ. Faith in Christ's finished work. Come to God, I mean. Well, same thing, but you get it. <laughs> in order to come to the Father, we come to him through faith in what Christ did, his finished work, not on any outward sign of anything else that we do. So this, this point 
uh, Paul is making here again and again. And just really quickly, going back to something uh, Luke uh, mentioned earlier, the reason why Paul is hammering this so hard has to be because of the knowledge of that this is still something people fight about. 2,000 years, some 2,000 odd years later, and there's still controversy on this topic of people being confused about what it's about, whether it's, you know, the way that we live, it's about our works and whatnot, or is it about faith in Christ's finished work, which is it? So for this channel and the channels that are associated with everyone here on the panel, and uh, most of the people in the chat room are, are part of, is uh, faith alone, through Christ alone, with nothing added. And uh, Paul's making that a really good point here. Um, I'll uh, send it over to you, Steve. All right. Um, All yeah. right. Yeah. Great. Great points. Awesome. Um, you know, uh, this is where a key verse here was what we were just you know, saying about that Paul is now, in some sense, starting a conclusionary response to what he's already said. He's answering the question that he posed in, uh, that you read, Luke, in verse 10. Uh, you know, um, again, he's saying, and the father of circumcision, which was Abraham, to them who are not of the circumcision only, but those who walk in the steps of that faith. And what what is the steps of that faith? Believing God that it was counted to Abraham for righteousness. Those are the steps of the faith of Abraham, of our father in the faith, who is Abraham. That's why he's called the father of many nations. Mm. Um, because he is indeed the first to, be, you know, to where it says, and Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. He's the first one for it to say those specific words. Now, yeah. now Abel was, I do believe, saved because he came in faith and i think that's where you know the, the the gospel started with adam and eve amen and so you follow it all, all along down the line you see the gospel the gospel the gospel and but the promise of jesus that was that was the prophecy that God gave to Adam and Eve of the gospel of the seed of the woman bruising the seed uh, of the serpent's head. Mm -hmm. That was the prophecy of what would come that the promise of that prophecy mm. would be that, that Jesus would come through the line of Abraham. And because of that seed, which is Christ. If you go over to Galatians chapter 3, you'll see this. Read Galatians chapter 3. It, Paul's yet a ta talking about this again. Mm -hmm. And he's referencing Genesis chapter, uh, I believe, somewhere around 12 to 15, that God gave this promise that through him all the nations of the world would be blessed. How? Through Christ. His yes. seed that God promised through his seed, all the nations of the world would be blessed. So from Abraham, you can trace down through 42 generations mm. to Christ, including Rahab, the harlot mm. or a whore that God saved by by her putting out a red cord mm -hmm. that I believe was a symbol of the blood of Christ to come through her line, mm. the line of a whore. <laughs> that just goes totally against the fact that 
we are supposed to work for our salvation in some way, shape, or form when Jesus used anybody that would be willing to, you know, believe him to accomplish his purpose. It's Jesus that saves. It came through Abraham, promised to him the prophecy given to Adam and Eve of Christ's coming for the, for the world. Amen. Yeah, so I, I just want to add one thing, and that is that the, the promise was as soon as Adam and Eve sinned, and as soon as they were cast from the garden, the promise was given to them. Cain and Abel both, and Seth, they all grew up understanding the promise from the very beginning. The promise was to come, and everyone is saved by what Christ did. So everyone was looking forward. Everyone in the faith was looking forward to the Savior coming. It went all the way through the Old Testament. In every book of the Bible, Jesus is preached. The Savior that is to come. That was great, Steve. Thanks for uh, mm -hmm. thanks for adding that. It was perfect. And no problem. I, I did want to add one thing. When I look back down at the verse, and Paul yet again hammers the point home that Abraham, the faith that he had, which he had, being yet uncircumcised. So he's hammering again that Abraham was not circumcised at this point when he had the imputed righteousness given to him by faith. There you go. Okay, excellent points by both of you. And I uh, I want to, I made some notes before you spoke, Steve, the things I wanted to mention, and it all pertains to what you just got through saying. And, uh, <laughs> there, there's a, um, but no, I, I still have a lot to say. <laughs> but we're awesome. Thinking, we're thinking in the same uh, direction right now. But uh, first of all, there's a saying that I think is, um, uh, people will not understand this until uh, until they've done a lot of Bible study. But this is very, very true. It's a premise. The Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. And the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. So you're talking about these things in the Old Testament, like Cain and Abel's different sacrifices and what pleased God and what God objected to and Adam and Eve's uh, attempt to solve the, the problem of nakedness on their own by sewing together the fig leaves and covering them so their nakedness but God rejected that as the solution and and uh, said I have to solve the problem with with a blood sacrifice a bloody skin of an animal and so um, these things people when they first read the Bible particularly if they don't understand Christianity and they just start reading Genesis 1-1 and start reading through it, they won't understand that. It's concealed to them because they don't know, understand the New Testament, the, the gospel. And so, but when we, we have the benefit now of hindsight, we understand the gospel. So when we go back to the beginning, we can even see that Adam and Eve at the fall, it was a gospel presented too. Do you want to rely on God for everything, the tree of life, or do you want to declare independence and you you get, you know right and wrong from eating from the tree of knowledge and you'll be on your own to make your own decisions, uh, a system of works or a system of faith in God. And uh, they chose to rebel against God, hoping that they could become gods themselves. So from the very first time with Adam and Eve, all the way through, we see all these, the theological terminology is pictures and shadows of Jesus's blood atonement. And there's many of them. I have a playlist titled The Bloody Trail. And uh, I go through probably 20 or 30 of these Old Testament pictures and shadows. So I think that would be helpful to everybody. But okay, I talked the first, my first turn, I talked about the context of let's, let's understand as, as an apostle and his role in the church. Um, but, but his role in the church is to clarify it and, and kind of ratchet it down a little tighter because uh, it was unclear in the Old Testament. And it, it's a kind of like, as I said, it's concealed there, but they can't really figure it out as clearly as we understand it now. Uh, so Paul was kind of clarifying it and chipping away all the unnecessary things that cause confusion. So you're left with one thing. You need to rely on God to, be, to save you instead of thinking you can do it yourself. Uh, 
And if you if you add any of your own efforts into it as a formula, faith in God plus your own efforts, then you've ruined it. You've got to rely on completely on God. So the the, God, the gospel has always been the same, and it is the, the message that uh, we're salvation, eternal life is available by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. But with Adam and Eve, and Cain and Abel, and so on and so on, all the way through, up until the time of Jesus, they didn't know that this Christ, which means the one to come, the promised one to be the Savior, they didn't know he was Jesus. Uh, so now we know we're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone. Or we're saved by Christ Jesus. They just knew it was Christ. It was God that would save them. Christ would save them. Now we know it's Christ Jesus. So uh, in hindsight, we, we, we shouldn't have any more confusion, but still we have people confusing it. In Paul's time, let's go back to the beginning of this Bible study uh, of Romans. Remember, you were with me the, the, the first time or the second time. When, when, we, when we talked about prosopopoeia, and trying to make everybody understand what Paul was doing here is he is responding to the false teachers who I believe he is the answer to the question of what was Paul's thorn in the flesh? People following Paul's churches and going and trying to spoil Paul's work by adding Judaism, saying you got to get circumcised, you got to do this, and you got to do that. And uh, Paul had this as a constant antagonism to his ministry. Uh, so in the first couple of chapters, we talked about, we did this pro to act it out. So you can see that Paul's technique was to present the false teacher's message and, co com and correct it with his own true message. And so that's continuing to, that, that still fits, it's still connected. What we're reading right now is connected to that original setting. He's still making the point that the false teachers have been coming in here and they're trying to tell you that you got to get circumcised. But no, let's go back and see what circumcision, how or what it really meant. Abraham was saved before he got circumcised. You see how it relates back to the original problem Paul's saying, presenting and false teachers are bringing, adding works to the gospel. Uh, so the, the gospel... Um, uh, message is the same. The idea of dispensationalism that some people think that during different periods of history, God had a different system for salvation for man. But it's always been the same. It's always Amen. been what? Amen is all it says. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah it's, I'm almost done here, so I know I'm taking it long, but it's no, always been the no. same. Where, uh, look, Adam and Eve were trying to rely on their works, and God corrects them. No, no, you can't solve it through your sewing of needle of fig leaves. Cain was trying to show, look, all the work I did to earn to earn your approval through my uh, plowing and watering and here's our herd. And he said, no, 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 you can't do it through your work. You have to rely on the blood sacrifice that I will provide. And, and Abel understands that he provided a blood sacrifice. Uh, so uh, dispensationalism, uh, as many people understand it here in America today, is really wrong. What dispensation Dispense, dispensing is Paul's the only one to use the word and he uses it three times at four times maybe and it just means to dispense means to uh, dis, like if you're dispensing let's say oh here's a Kleenex tissue for you and here's a Kleenex tissue for you I'm dispensing the tissue everybody's crying so they all need a tissue well that's dispensing passing out something dispensing it well yep. what, what what is being dispensed here it's the message of the gospel. God gradually dispenses a little more detail, a little more detail. And now we have all the details and we understand it's Christ Jesus. And the blood what was required was done on that cross with Jesus. So, um, yeah, that's, that's what we need to understand as we're reading the rest of this uh, epistle and, uh, and all of Paul's writings. I don't want to divert the conversation, but why is that so hard for dispensationalists to understand? Why does it have to be so complicated and separated out into this thing that makes it end up being uh, way more than it needs to be? Uh, the gospel okay, is simple. 
You want me to answer that, or is, is that a rhetorical question? Like it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be hard. Anybody should understand it, right? That's all I, I mean. I'll yeah. tell you. I'll tell you why. I'm going to answer it anyway. I, okay. I think I know why. I don't think anybody today would dream up dispensationalism on their own. I think the people who are espousing dispensationalism today, some of our friends do it, and they're doing it because they read it and were taught it by a theologian. And not because, the, you know, if you weren't taught it, you wouldn't automatically you'd just see it in the scriptures. It wouldn't be obvious unless someone taught it to you and you it was uh, forced, forced on you. That's why. Mm -hmm. That's why they do it. They've been brainwashed to believe that's the way it is. And once they once they fall into that, especially when you find out that it's it's uh, it was pretty much a majority position here in America the last hundred years. I never I never heard of it until about four or five years ago. It was the first time I, I ran into some people that believed it. I didn't grow up in any uh, dispensationalist church, fortunately for me. So it was a new thing to me. And uh, it took me a long time to even understand what their tenets were, like what, what they were trying to say. Well, it, it, got, it was really started in America by John Nelson Darby and then uh, Schofield, uh, C.A. C. A. Schofield, C.S.? C.S. Well, Schofield. Schofield, uh, yeah. He put it. He put uh, the theology of Darby's dispensationalism into a reference Bible in the footnotes, and then the, the Schofield reference Bible was adopted by all the American seminaries. So all of the all of the theologians and the uh, the, the pastors of the last hundred years or 150 years, they've been learning this through the Schofield reference Bible and teaching it to the masses. That's mm -hmm. how it all came. Yeah, Darby and Schofield are responsible for a lot of um, confusion, for sure, and false doctrines. Okay. I'm going to read this this verse here, and before we go to the next verse, just read it in the Amplified to see how it phrases it. Uh, verse 12 is, uh, um, And that he would be the spiritual father of those circumcised who are not only circumcised, but who also walk in the steps of the faith of our father Abraham, which he had before he was circumcised. So he's, it's saying that, hey, he had the faith before he was circumcised, and, and that's what we need to copy. Uh, all right, I'll go to, I'll post here for, you can read it, verse 13 now. Uh, let me read it out loud, then I'll post it there. It says, for the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. Let's see, it's Steve's turn to go first this time. I'll post that verse now. All right. So um, the, the way I see this verse is a, a starting of a change of course from circumcision and uncircumcision to to the law but saying using circumcision and uncircumcision as the focal point to say that not only was abraham justified by faith prior to circumcision but any other part that came into play through the law um and it, we already know from, I believe, Romans chapter 3, that the law was given to be, uh, to, to shut people's mouths. Um, and to, you know, so that nobody would be able to stand before God uh, on their own, on their own righteousness. Um, but uh, the, the promise that he should be heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law. That's it's not, it's not saying if you if you read it without understanding the commas and the English language here, you'll think it's saying the promise wasn't given to Abraham or his seed. No, he's saying the promise wasn't given through the law to Abraham. But through the righteousness of faith. So the promise was given to Abraham's heir. To the, 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 for, uh, let me start again. 
it to to read it the way I understand this verse to be saying it, based on the commas. If you pull the comma parts out, uh, the for the promise was to Abraham through the righteousness of faith, not through the law. That's how he is heir to the world, through his seed, through the righteousness of faith. He's, he's starting to make that point where he's using, he started out with circumcision and uncircumcision, which came before the law, but then was incorporated into the law. Uh, and he's saying all of that has nothing to do with the promise that was given to Abraham or to his seed. It's not through the law. It's only by faith. So that again goes, you know, against what the, you know, the, the hyper dispensation, you know, people say. And Paul even says when he's talking about revelation or talking about the dispensation, he's talking, he says the dispensation of the revelation that was given to him. It was the revelation, not what the period of time it was god was revealing like you said luke the old testament he was revealing it and paul wrote two-thirds in the new testament and that's why we say the new testament is the old testament revealed because mm -hmm. that revelation was given to paul that's why he wrote it so that we could then be able to understand what the old testament is really talking about Mm -hmm. um, so yeah that's that's what i get there yep um i second that point and we'll just add to that that in the verse in verse 13 there's three words that stand out to me the first one is promise so this is the promise it's it's not a suggestion it's not a passing thing. It is a promise of God. And for those of us that believe, we know that God fulfills all his promises. Okay, Amen. so what what is the promise? Well, the promise is being an heir of the world. Uh, in other words, we're inheriting this as a promise from, from him. And uh, how do we not receive it? You know, the, the first thing he mentioned, you could switch the whole sentence around. It would still make sense. You could uh, put uh, through through the righteousness of faith, but not through uh, the law. But the way that uh, Paul's chosen to phrase it is so that we focus on what it isn't first. So it's not to Abraham or the seed through the law. In other words, that's not how it happens. So what's the final answer in the third part of this, the third word that stands out, which is faith? but through the righteousness of faith, righteousness that is imputed from the coming Savior at the point of the, the Old Testament writing, but it was still the promise that was made from the beginning of time. From the time that sin first entered the world, the promise was already prepared. And the promise was going to always come through faith. So the promise is first, Paul tells us how how it's not received, how it's not gone gone by, which is through the law. And then the answer to everything, which is how it's going to occur, righteousness of faith. Brother Luke? Yeah. Amen. It's, uh, there's not a whole lot to say about that verse. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, I'll read it in the Amplified just so you can see it doesn't really add uh, amplify it very much, but uh, it says, for the promise to Abraham or to his descendants that uh, he would be heir of the world was not through observing the requirements of the law, but through the righteousness of faith. It's very, very straightforward, and it's just kind of concluding the, the points that uh, uh, preceded it. So let me go to the next uh, scriptures to uh, read, read that. Uh, I posted it for you already. It says, for this, I'm going to read two verses, 14 and 15, because they, they go together. <clears throat> uh, for if they which are of the law be heirs, faith is made void, 
and the promise made of none effect because the law worketh wrath for where no law is there is no transgression mm -hmm. okay uh i think it's uh i think it's uh, Crip, brother Cripp's turn to go first this time yeah, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to flip it around a little bit and, and use a little analogy. So there, are, there is a place in Germany called the Autobahn. For those of you that don't know about it, so it's a, a very, very long stretch of road through mostly country in Germany where there is no speed limit. On that stretch of road, it's driver beware because you can drive as fast as you want to without any threat of any law. Okay, so you know where this is going. So in a place on the Autobahn, if you look at Autobahn as a place where there is no law, then there is no transgression. So in this world, if there was no law, there would be no one that would be even be able to be called a sinner. So the verse in 15, uh, the law worketh wrath, for where no law is, there is no transgression. So that's the analogy that popped into my head. That, one's, that one seems pretty solid. Um, again, he uh, Paul goes back to the the heirs that he mentioned in the verse before, uh, for which are uh, for if they which are of the law be heirs. In other words, if they're not coming through righteousness, and then he follows up with um, with the wrath, uh, the law worketh wrath. So faith is made void. Now, in the verse before, he makes it very clear that that's how we come is through faith. And so he's he's doing that thing again, Luke, that you're that you've talked about before. He's he's presenting both both points in order to drive it home. And so faith is made void. Uh, the promise of none effect. So again, the promise is first. He tells us how it doesn't happen in the verse before. And then he tells us how it does happen through faith. He does it again. He backs it up again to make the to bring the point, make sure that people understand. Promise is made of none effect. It cancels out the promise if it's by works, because uh, God made it clear that it was through faith. Brother Luke. Um, every once in a while, someone uh, asks me this question. Uh, Brother Luke, what do you think about um, a Roman Catholic or somebody that uh, believes like a Roman Catholic that they do believe in Jesus and they do believe that uh, his, uh, in his death, their own resurrection, uh, but they also believe in, in uh, uh, you know, they've got to be good and follow either commandments or laws or, or uh, requirements of the Roman church or whatever. Uh, what do you think there is their uh, status and their their fate? And uh, I mean, it's wishful thinking to uh, to think that somehow, whether it's Roman Catholic or just a uh, what we would call a lordship heretic, to 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 give them any kind of uh, hope that they have that could get salvation by mixing their own righteousness. With the blood of Jesus, we we dare not do that uh, because we are sending them into the lake of fire if we do. Because Paul says here, and Paul says over and over again, and Paul's mission statement, and Paul's primary contribution, and Paul's main distinction that more so than any other person in the Bible is this very point and it is that you read the verse uh, for if they which are of the law be heirs faith is made void and the promise made of none effect uh, you know paul says this same thing over and over again in his epistles in a number of different ways but it, it doesn't need to be made any more clear than it is here in verse 14 it says that your faith is made void void is mean it doesn't exist it has it's you might as well have no faith at all if this is the kind of faith you have the promise is made in effect whether it's the promise uh, of abraham or it's the promise of jesus uh, that we under 
it's the same promise, but it's now we understand it more clearly. It's it's more than just uh, uh, the vague promise made to Abraham. It's just more specifically made in the New Testament. But that promise is of none effect to you if that you are uh, putting faith in the law. And the law could be understood not just as the law of Moses or the laws of Moses or the laws of the uh, co uh, conscience. Uh, in Paul says that the law was uh, given to the Gentiles in, in their conscience. And so it's uh, it doesn't matter if it's, uh, you know, the law that uh, the Gentiles had, uh, the law that Abraham had, the law that the Jews got with Moses, or the laws that we have today, uh, it's, it's all, doesn't matter what it, uh, how you describe or define the, the law, but it's presenting your righteousness to God and thinking that, well, my righteousness is pretty darn good, so that ought to impress God. We need to reject that entirely. And, and as the, 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 the hymn says, nothing but the blood, nothing but the blood. Uh, my, only, my only plea is the blood of Jesus. Um, so Amen. this verse here should, should destroy any idea, and we should never give anybody hope. I had to disfellowship a couple of close friends a couple of years ago over this very point. They, they were saying that when we got to Acts chapter 15, verse 1, and the men from Judea were telling Paul's uh, disciples, you can't be saved unless you're circumcised too. You believe in Jesus, but it's not up. you got to also get circumcised. Well, they, they said what someone said to me just recently. Well, come on, they're just saying you, they believe in Jesus, but they, want, they think you got to be circumcised too, or you got to get water baptized too, or you got to do this or that. Come on, don't you think that God will save them too? No! We cannot give them any hope for that false, that's a delusion that's, a, that's clearly debunked by Paul over and over and over again. Mm. That's, the main, that's the main thing we need to learn from the Apostle Paul. Mm. Agreed. Uh, okay, uh, before I go to Amen. the next verse, uh, anything else on that before we go to the next verse? Uh, just um, one, uh, hold on, Steve. One, I, sure. I need to step away for just a minute. I'll be right back and it uh, won't take me that long. Excuse me. Okay. All sure. Right, Steve. Any, any more on that before we go move forward? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think you guys made excellent, excellent points, you know. Uh, and I'd just like to go back to Romans, Romans 3, verses, verses uh, 19 and 20. It, it, you know, it, and I want to make this point that, you know, like you, you were saying, Paul is driving this point over and over and over again that it's not this that saves you 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 but jesus that saves you and your faith in him is how you receive that salvation you know over and over he's saying it's not circumcision it's not law it's not food it's not drink it's not it's not how many times you pray. It's not, you know, any of those things. It's, it's faith in Jesus that gives us the imputed righteousness. It's not of us. I mean, everywhere you look, Paul is saying something to that effect. And in Romans 3, if we're, when we're talking about the law there in those verses in chapter 4, we can go back here and show Romans 3:19 through 20. Now we know that what things soever the law saith. Now we know that whatever things the law is telling you, it's telling you to you who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped, that every mouth may be shut. The law is saying to Everybody that is under the law, shut up about your righteousness. And that all the world will become guilty before God. Therefore, because of what I said before, that's what therefore means. Because of what I said before, by the deeds of the law, doing those outwardly righteous works, Therefore, 
because of what I said before, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh, none, zip, zilch, dada, none, nobody, nobody will be justified in God's sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. Law can't save you. And that's what that's what he's saying there again in in verses uh, uh, 14 and 15. That that if if they which are of the law or as in chapter three said under the law, if they're somehow heirs, then what I'm saying here about faith and what the Old Testament said about the faith of Abraham that saved him is, is then made void. Faith and law do not coexist because law shows sin. Faith looks to God. The law looks at man. That's why the blood in the Old Testament, when it covered over sin, it appeased God. It didn't please God because it didn't cleanse sin yet. And that's where people get misunderstood because uh, misunderstand the Old Testament uh, in part because that was for earthly blessings or cursing if they didn't do it right. But it had nothing to do with salvation. Jesus said, and it says it again in Hebrews, I believe, uh, Lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do thy will, O God. So Jesus says the book is all about me. And what book was he talking about? The Old Testament. And that's where the law was written. The law came after he, Paul discusses the same point again about the promise came before the law in Galatians chapter three. That's why I referenced it earlier. Um, you know, the, no flesh, just like in chapter three, no flesh is saved by the law because faith is not the law. The law looks at man when god sees the law this is what i was talking about with the blood covering when god saw the law in the ark of the covenant you had three three pieces that represented god's perfection in the ark of the covenant when the blood covered over that he saw the blood for that year now he sees christ's blood that covers us who believe so that he no longer sees the standard of perfection and then sees us, he's not looking at us through the law's lens anymore. He's looking at the blood of Christ covering and now cleansing and has cleansed, purged once for all, all sin, my sin, because I believe him and believe that he was able to accomplish what he set out to do. That's why the law cannot make one pure because the law is showing me how impure I am. That's why the law cannot make me err because it is not faith. Because you're working out, you're trying to make it happen, whereas faith trusts God to do it on your behalf, in your place, as a substitution. That's why we call Jesus our substitute, our substitutionary sacrifice. He took my place for me and as me so that's the, the law works wrath another verse says the strength of sin is the law so the law works wrath because all it is is a standard and because the strength of the sin of sin is the law when you tell a child don't eat the cookie what do they do they go eat the cookie because you've now strengthened the law. They know it's wrong. And in their sinful nature, prior to salvation, they don't have the Holy Spirit yet, though they may be under the age of accountability. That's a whole other subject. But for where no law is, there is no transgression. I loved what, what Jason said of, about that. That is so true. If you don't tell the child... They can't take the cookie. Then if they take the cookie or not, it's not a transgression. So, yeah. Amen. I, I can't wait to get to verse 16, though, because he's, he's like summing it up again. 
All right, then. Uh, Brother Cripps, uh, you had to step away. Did you hear anything and you want to respond to it? Yeah, I heard most of the last of it, and I think Steve did a great job. So I'll just brush over. You uh, You read 19 and 20, correct? Uh, uh, no, read uh, 14 and 15 in, uh, in Romans yeah. 4. He oh, went 14. 19, he went to, he went to uh, chapter 3 of, uh, back to chapter 3. We're on Romans 4, 14 and 15. Yeah, 15. So I, I didn't. Okay, there's 15. Yeah, I went back I'm to confused. chapter 3 okay. uh, to show the, the similarities of what he's saying. Yeah. You know, that you. he's basically rewording uh, again what he said in chapter 3. Yeah. Uh, he's exactly. just hammering it home in a different way, hoping like, you know, a preacher does. He'll, re, he'll say the same thing five times about the gospel and trying to word it in such a way that people will understand what he's saying. Perfect. Well, I think you did a great job, so I'll stand on that. Way to go. Uh, okay. Yeah, it's a good point. Um, going back to chapter three, we could go back to chapter one, two, three, because as the point we've, we've been continuing to make is that uh, Paul is, um, he's making one point. And, and from, from the beginning of Romans to where we are right now, it's still the same point. <laughs> it's just he's expanding and and clarifying and clarifying it. And as as, as Steve says, sometimes you you find you express it one way, and then you, then you try to illustrate it in another way, another way. So it's hoping that at some point people it'll click, and people like Brother Cripps, you asked, why is it people don't get it? Yeah, uh, I don't know, but Paul apparently had the problem. They had to keep repeating it in every way he possibly could imagine. I've I've developed presenting the gospel over the years, uh, talking to some people who um, they would continue to be list, listening and interested, but they couldn't quite get it. And they forced me to try to come up with a new, other, better way of, of giving them an example to illustrate it. And it's kind of like caused me to refine my skill at communicating it. Amen. And Paul is doing this here where he's, he's trying to make this point, same point. He's making it over and over again and clarifying it. So every way he can to make people get it, that, Forget your own righteousness. Yeah. If you put any faith in your own righteousness, you're lost. <laughs> yeah. If you add anything to it. Yeah. As, any as one Matthias, thing. Matthias like to say, uh, the, it's the cross plus nothing. The cross plus something equals nothing. Yeah. yeah, yeah we've, talk, we've talked about that quite a bit, but you're absolutely right. Well, that's what Paul said in the last verse there. He, he, remember, he said that... Uh, 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 love it. Uh, yeah, yeah it, you made the faith. You're making the faith void. You make it void. You have nothing. So, Paul saying you've made faith void, and Matthias says the cross plus anything equals nothing. Yeah, you, that means void. So it, it's like this. If if, if people if people can think of it like this, uh, brother Luke, who who would you think from? Um, from earthly standards, or or well, not even like that. Let's say. Who do you think lived the best life as a human, other than other than Christ, in you, in uh, history? I want to make a joke. Hold I on. Would say, I would say of all the people in history that I'm aware of, anything being written about them, uh -huh. is Job. Job. Okay, so Job. So you take Job in one column, and you take Christ in the other column. So if you had to rest on the way that Job lived his life or the way that Christ lived his life in order to make sure that you were able to spend eternity with the Father in heaven, which would you choose? Jesus. That's right. So not, if you, not Joel Osteen's best life now. That's right. <laughs> well, that's, that's what I'm kind, of, kind of what I'm getting to. So if any person puts themselves in the category because Job is a good choice. I mean, brother Luke picked uh, that. That was excellent. I mean, that, uh, if, if God himself is looking at Job and saying, look, have you seen my servant Job? Look how he's upright in all his ways, etc." So that's a perfect example. So even if it is Job though, in one column and Christ in the other. So if you are able to look at yourself in any way, shape or form and realize that even on your best day, 
if you're using your best day in this world where you think that you did not even sin, doing an unknown sin and any of that, if you would rather take that and take your chances rather than on what Christ did on the cross, then you really, really need to shift your thinking. Uh, and, and guess what? You don't have to make a choice. The choice has been made for you. Christ finished the work on the cross. Your sins are imputed. All you have to do is accept it. That's it. And it's not a work. It's just believing it. It is through faith that we're saved, not of works, lest any man should boast. Bottom line. That's it. Brother Luke? Uh, you, you're muted, Brother Luke. Okay, yeah, thanks. I, I think I already posted that uh, the next verses. You the did. That's where I got confused. You posted 16 and 17, and when I came back, uh, I could see it. Or 19 and 20, excuse me, 19 oh, and 20. Oh, that's right. I, I posted those from Chapter 3. That was Steve went back, so I put it up. Uh, but, no, uh, we're now uh, going to be on um, – 16 and 17 so let me let me just post 16 i'll read it first gotcha well, i didn't give my thoughts on 14 and 15 but um or maybe i did i don't remember <laughs> doesn't matter no that's okay uh, read 14 and 15 in the amplify just to see how it phrases it it says if those who are followers of the law are the true heirs of abraham then faith leading to salvation is of no effect and void and the promise of God is nullified. For the law results in God's wrath against sin, but where there is no law, there is no violation of it either. Okay, so that, that expresses it very clearly. Let me read now mm. uh, the gospel. Wow. Did you want to say something about that, Steve? Or I was going to go. I just thought that was beautifully amplified, and I think in a very clear way that. Uh, makes a whole lot of sense there couldn't yeah. have worded it better in a in an expository myself no i i would agree and actually being on these shows with brother luke and him reading from the amplified i i have a whole new view of uh using the amplified for exactly that purpose uh i i think i think it's a great uh study tool especially if you if you use the king james version as the main one and then you back it up with the uh, Amplified. I think it works great for Bible study. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to post uh, the next verse in the KJV in the chat. There it is. Oh, it won't post at all. Oh, let me. Hmm, I'll just. I'll just read it. And, let me see. I'll post half of it. And then I'll post the other half. There it is. Sixteen. Yeah. Let me see. Control. Seed, seed, seed. Okay, I had to split it in half, but there it is. Uh, so you can read along with me. It says, therefore, it is of faith that it might be by grace. Mm. To the end, the promise might be sure to all the seed, mm. not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Mm. Okay, it's uh, Brother Stevens gets to go first on this. Bring it home, Steve. Okay. <laughs> all right. All right. All right. So this is definitely a, just verse 16 alone is a, is a rather large verse. Um and again, we see this therefore uh, word, which if, if you remember, that, that means because of what I've just stated, because of what I've already been explaining, uh, because of what there before, I now state this. It is of faith. What is of faith? The righteousness is of faith therefore i conclude would be another way to say it i conclude that righteousness is of faith that salvation it might be by grace to the end the promise 
might be sure to all the seed. Not maybe, not kinda, not I wonder, sure, complete. No, no needing to question, no, no doubt about it. <laughs> no doubt um, about it. No doubt about it, you know, um, and not sure in us, but sure in him. Mm -hmm. And because we believe it's sure in him, not sure because I've done anything, but because of what Christ has done. That's why it's of faith, not by the law, not by circumcision, not by any of these things he's already mentioned. Um, not to that only, so not to the seed only, All which the is seed. of the law, but to that also, which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. So not to just the Jews and, you know, that, that are of the physical line, but to the faith line of Abraham, the seed that came to Christ, or that came through Abraham to Christ, that we believe, whether we were believing on, on Christ, which is the Messiah, or the anointed one, that's what they were looking forward to. We look back to Christ being crucified, already completing the mission of being the Messiah, the Savior, and, you know, uh, the, the idea of needing a savior means you can't do it yourself. If you're drowning and you try to save yourself, you're still going to drown. <laughs> you, you can't save yourself if you can't swim to, to the shore. Mm. Whether you know how to swim or not, if you're already drowning at that point, mm. you have lost the ability to do anything. And even more so when a lifeguard, a savior in the natural comes to save you from drowning. And Jesus saved us from drowning in sin mm. that he could pull us onto the shore of righteousness when we try to get off the boat into the water to swim to shore because the boat is sinking and I make it 40 yards to the shore and Jason makes it 10 yards to, uh, from the shore and Luke makes it five yards from the shore and all three of us drowned just because they could swim five and 10 yards farther than me in their own righteousness, we're all dead. Amen. And that's the gospel that Christ, no matter whether we can swim five yards in our own righteousness or a hundred yards, if we fall short, which we all do, it's clear, Romans 3.23, we have all fallen short mm, all. of the glory of God. Every single one of us, that Christ is the, is, is the gap filler. No matter how far the gap is, from you to righteousness, pure, 100% perfect righteousness, which is what is required mm -hmm. for salvation. Amen. Jesus fills that gap. Um, and, you know, so uh, I, I saw an example, and I want to use it to illustrate this again. Uh, if each one of us has a carton of eggs, and that carton says it's a dozen eggs, right? And it says that's 12 eggs, right? Mm -hmm. And each of us has that carton. On the outside, it looks like, with the lid closed, we've, we, you know, we should have 12 eggs, right? Because that's what yeah. the law says. Right. Well, when, when we open it up and people look in, inside, 
and see, I got six eggs, and Jason has nine eggs, and Luke has 11 eggs. The law is 12 eggs. What? Yeah. The law is 12 eggs. Yeah. And none of us have 12 eggs. And so what Jesus does, when we believe in him and believe in his finished work, he comes in and, and puts six eggs in my basket and puts four eggs in Jason's basket or three eggs. There you go. It's one egg in Luke's basket. So we all have 12 eggs. But without Jesus, we'd have fallen short of God's standard of perfection. And so that's why what Paul is saying here, therefore, it is of faith that it might be of grace. The grace is giving us what we don't deserve. I don't deserve those extra six eggs in my basket. I don't deserve to make that extra 10 yards because I can't do it on my own because through the lens of the law, I am not perfect. Mm. So wow. Wow. it's to all of us of the seed of Abraham by faith and not just to those who were under the law, but it's to all of us, whether you were under the law or be before the law or after the law, it can't be by the law, but by faith alone. Mm. That's what he's saying here. And that's mm. why Abraham is the father of us all. Amen. Right, and what is it's by faith? I think, went, I think he went first, so uh, I think I don't think uh, Brother Cripps spoke on these verses yet, did you? I no, not yet. Verse 17. <laughs> That's go okay. Ahead, Brother Cripps. Go, go ahead, Jason. Yeah, no. Well, first let me say that th that was that was masterful, and I I mean, you know, praise God, Steve. I mean, you you said that very well. And um, what is the phrase? Uh, what does all What does all mean? And the answer is all means all. That's all all means. So uh, Brother Steve brought up the all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, which is a verse that a lot of us know. So the the key word there is all. All have sinned. So to use uh, Steve's analogy and piggyback off that, the first thing I want to say that in my carton there would be eggshells. That where the yolk and, and the egg parts already been used, and I put the shells back in the carton. That that that's how how uh, sinful I am. Um, you know, before God would replace those with with his uh, his eggs, which is the the he he meets all the requirements of sin. And as far as uh, swimming to the shore, absolutely, I love I love both analogies. Uh, the point to get from all that is, of course, that no matter how good of a swimmer we think we are or how good of a cook, none of it, none of it measures up. And so uh, God is the propitiation for our sin and the imputed righteousness comes. And that is for all of the seed because we all fall short um, and come, we all fall short. We all sin. Um, that's all. All right. Um, I think I'll just, uh, let me read this verse 16 in the amplified and tell me what you think of this, uh, how well they did this verse. Therefore, inheriting the promise depends entirely on faith. That is confident trust in the unseen God in order that it may be given as an act of grace, that is, his unmerited favor and mercy, so that the promise will be legally guaranteed to all the descendants of Abraham, not only for those Jewish believers who keep the law, but also for those Gentile believers who share the faith of Abraham, who is the spiritual father of us all. Mm. Not bad. Mm -hmm. It's just a more long-winded way of saying all. <laughs> Not too shabby. Not too shabby, sir. And and that's the, the you know uh, that's that's what you know there again like with the whole all thing. That's what Paul was 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 saying there. You know, it's not just for the Jews, y'all. <clears throat> It's not just for the Jews. It's not just for the Gentiles, man. I'd like yeah. to uh, 
it's for it's for you talk your about, buddy. You, you, uh, you've talked about the verse uh, exhaustively, so no, let me uh, take this time to say that. Uh, yes, I notice that um, I, I've made this point several times about Paul has this recurring theme he's repeating about uh, not law faith. Yep, uh, and that the the uh, the Judaizers are coming into my churches. They're a thorn in my flesh. They're telling you you've got to follow the law. So that's why I keep telling you, no, if you do that, you make it void. Faith is void. And so that's, that's the pulse theme. But I see that there's a twin theme, really. And the other theme that is, is, is parallel goes right alongside this theme is the theme that uh, it's not just Jew, but Gentile. So on one hand, he's saying, it's got to only be faith, no law. And on the other hand, he's saying it's, it, it has to be include Gentiles and Jews, not just gen Jews. So those are the, the two uh, themes here that I can see that uh, he continues to make this point. Look, he's using the Jews and the Gentiles to make a point. He's using the law and faith to make a point. Uh, all right. Uh, read the next verse, uh, verse 17. Uh, I don't, I don't think there's so much here, so I'll just won't even post it. You can just, uh, Brother Cripps, you go first on this one. It's verse 17. I'll just read it. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations before him whom he believed, even God, who quickeneth the dead and calleth those things which be not as though they were. Let me read it in the Amplified for your benefit, too. It says, as it is written in Scripture... I have made you a father of many nations in the sight of him in whom he believed, that is God, mm. who gives life to the dead and calls into being that which does not exist. Uh, so your thoughts on verse 17, Brother Cripps? Yeah, I like I like uh, uh, quickening in the first version and the amplified raising of the dead. It means basically the same thing, but I just like the way quickened. I've always liked that that word. Because uh, that's what he's doing in us. We, we are the dead. We, all of us, are the dead before uh, we're, we're given uh, the imputed righteousness. And then we are alive forevermore because of him. And uh, we, all of us that are children of God have been quickened. And that is the, the act of the imputed righteousness of Christ. And it is what saves us all. All of us can be saved by that one way only. Um, and the one way is Jesus. It all comes back to that. Uh, I think it ties it up beautifully. Steve? Yeah. Um, this is one of those spots where uh, Paul quotes the Old Testament, but he wants to make it absolutely crystal clear that what I'm telling you is from Scripture. I mean, he, he quotes it in other places without saying, as it is written, but here he's saying, look, this is what the, the scripture's saying. I have made thee a father of many nations. Many nations implies the fact that it's not just the nation of Israel. It's many nations. So if God's word be true and every man a liar then it cannot be the promise only to the nation of Israel, to the Jews alone. It must be to many nations, which would include Jews and Israel, Jerusalem, those that, that live in that area, which is what a nation is, is a, a land space and where people come from. But that it's a, he's the father of many nations. How? He's already said it by faith. And it was before him who he believed. Before God, whom Abraham believed. Even God who quickened the dead. Who quickeneth the dead. And quickened the dead, the dead Abraham, and made him alive through the righteousness that came by faith. Amen. There's that word again. Who, yep, yep. 
Yep. By faith. And and that God calls those things which are not as though they were. In myself, I am not righteous. Mm -mm. But God calls me righteous, even though I'm not, as if I was because of my faith. Yep. Because I believed him. So he's calling those things which are not as though they were. I'm not righteous, but he gives me that righteous, thereby calling me righteous. Amen. Yeah, and the the mechanism is the belief. That's that's the that's the mechanism that makes it all work. Yep. Yep. Uh, let me see. We got um, melted zone. Uh, he made a comment, and if we look back to Genesis seventeen five, that's where the scriptures comes from for Romans four seventeen. So I looked that up, and it says. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham. For a father of many nations have I made thee. Mm -hmm. So uh, thank you, Melted Zone, for bringing that back Amen. to my attention. Uh, that's that's awesome, and it's have it's that. Uh, can you read that one more time, Luke? Yeah. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be called Abraham. For a father of many nations have I made thee. Right. For a father of many nations have I made thee. Yeah, that is past tense. Yep. Already done. Yeah. So I'd like to hear your thoughts on why that, why you think that's significant. Because obviously at the time that is said, He's not a father of many nations as far as, uh, you know, his, he doesn't even have uh, uh, Ishmael or I, Isaac born yet. So uh, right. he doesn't have that kind of a descendancy uh, in, you know, in existence yet. And yet he says, have made you. So well, you, you're, you're making a, bringing it to our attention that it's past tense, Steve. So uh, tell me more about why that's so important. Yeah, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> I want to hear this you too. Sneaky, sneaky guy. You know? <laughs> I can see it in my head, Steve. I I can help you with it if you do. Um. Da, 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 da. Because well, there's there's one thing here. Um, Genesis fifteen six, and this is where he's quoting uh, earlier, and he believed in the Lord, and it, and he. The Lord counted it to him for righteousness. Uh, what I'm trying to find is is the promise. Um, okay. Uh, uh, da, 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 da. Yeah, let, find uh, Brother Cripps, uh, let me ask Brother Cripps to give his thoughts on my question while you're looking for something. Go ahead. Yeah, it's uh, inter it's entertain entertaining to for me to try to think about Abraham wrapping his mind around the idea that God said to him, "Have," as in as in past tense. Uh, you know, without without any TV or movies or anything that would uh, represent fantastic stories of time travel or being able to see into the future and and, and see this thing actually happen. Um, I think part of the reason why the, the righteousness was imputed unto him is because he just chose to believe him without being able to see it. That's what faith is, believing in uh, things that, ha that we're not able to see. So Abraham was able to do that, even not knowing who God was before that first meeting. So it, it is an amazing thing for someone that hasn't you know, heard on a broadcast or seen in, in the, the word or ever heard about God to believe his promises before they happened. And God is, God is stating it as fact because to him, it is fact that mm -hmm. he yeah. has already done this. It already is being done, has been done, even though Abraham couldn't see it. So it, he, yeah. in order for him to wrap his mind around it, he had to use faith. That's the only way he could have done it. Yeah. There, I to me, I think you're right. 
the way you phrased it was good. The uh, it's as good as done. It's settled. It's guaranteed. It's uh, it is written. You know, once anything, when, once God has written it, and then said, "Thus saith the Lord," it's good. It's good as gold. You can count on it. It might as well have already happened because God proclaimed it. So that's how how confident we can be. So that's uh, that's how I think we. It makes sense to me, but also yes, Lord, God. God is not restricted by thinking in a timeline like us. Either. He's not. Yep, he's not in the timeline. He's able to pass in and out of time because he is yeah. is the God of time. Okay. Right. So, Steve, we answered your, the question I posed to you. What do you think of our answers? Is that how what you had in mind? Yeah, I just wanted to. Uh, I read that verse in Genesis 15 where it shows that Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. But the promise that God gave him uh, that we're talking about was given in chapter 12, uh, verses 1 through 3. Um, and it says, Now the Lord had said unto Abraham, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, yeah. unto a land that I will show thee. And, here's where the promise comes in, mm -hmm. I will make of thee a great nation, mm -hmm. and I will bless thee, mm -hmm. and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. There it is. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. Mm. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Amen. That was before it says, and Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness. Mm -hmm. There so it is. So when we go back to, to uh, the verse there in in Romans we are in chapter 4 yep okay yep. Uh, as, as it is written I have made thee a father of many nations before him who he believed mm -hmm. even God who quickeneth the dead and calleth those things which be not as though they were and another reason why that chapter in Genesis 12, I referenced Galatians 3 earlier, that they tie directly together because Paul is talking about this same thing, that the promise of Abraham is to us that believe. And I just read the promise of Abraham in Genesis 12. Yep. The promise was and granted the moment that Abraham believed. Exactly. And that's how he became the father of many nations. Amen. The mechanism I is think. believing. Yep. The mechanism is believing. When a person believes, then God says, I have given this to you. And that means every promise in his word. Every, every promise that a, a son or daughter of, of Christ has in, in the word is, is said to us in, in past tense, as if it already has been given the moment we accept it. The very moment we accept it, that's when the quickening happens. Yep. Right. Uh, um, Amen. I posted verse 18 in the chat room for you. It says, Who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father. Oh, someone made a chat and jumped up. Uh, that he might be, become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. Mm. Okay. Uh, Brother brother Steve? Uh, okay. <laughs> um, verse 18, who believed, Abraham, who believed, he believed, he believed against hope. He believed in, in hope. So against hope, believed Abraham in hope. Our hope is God. Mm -hmm. That's who he believed in. Yeah. Because it was against hope to the natural man. But God is our hope. In whom is our ever-present help in time of need. That God's ways are higher than our ways. 
That's what it's talking about here. He didn't believe in what he saw in his mind and in his nat in the natural man, but God said it. I believe it. It is so. That settles it. That's faith. That is faith. God mm -hmm. said it. I believe it. That settles, that settles it. It, That's it, it is so. Here's uh, my um, question. I have a question for you and, and Brother Cripps uh, about that verse here. Uh, it says, um, who against hope believed in hope? Uh, I read that in the Amplified because it doesn't help me either. But it says, uh, in hope against hope, is how the Amplified says it. In hope against hope, yeah. the KJV says, who against hope believed in hope. Uh, the only thing I could say about in the KJV, who against hope believed in hope, is that maybe, okay, against all odds, it's what seems to be so unlikely, what seems to be impossible. Come on, you're promising me that uh, I'm going to be have all these descendants and, you know, you're, all this you promised to me is like hard to imagine it, but I'll believe it. Uh, I, I don't think, I think that's the only way I can interpret, but it, the way it's written is hard for me to understand. So if you got more insights, who against hope believed in hope? <laughs> Brother Crips, what do you think about it? Yeah, yeah, it's just the way it's phrased. Now, this was a this was a phrase that I heard growing up. They they don't use it much anymore. At least I haven't heard people use it. But the idea of, um, like, to use it in a sentence, it would say, um, "The nervous man hoped against hope that when he asked his fiance or asked his girlfriend to marry him, she would say yes." <laughs> And and that's kind of the 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 theme the theme of it is that it, a person just I mean I I picture the guy like clenching his fist kind of and just shaking a little bit hoping against hope just really really putting everything into it as far as the the fervor behind the desire for it so in this verse who who is Abraham as Steve said who that's who we're talking about Abraham. Against hope, he's clenching his fist. He's just believing, just fully believing with everything that's in him that he might become the father of many nations. And then it says, according. According means uh, what is about to come, which is the, the, the very promise from God. That's, that's what it uh, pertains to, which was spoken. It was spoken to Abraham. So, thy sh so shall thy seed be. And that's the clincher. That's the clincher sentence right there. It is going to happen, Abraham, and Abraham hoped. He just, for, with everything that was in him, hoped, and it was counted unto him for righteousness, as righteousness. That's the best yeah. I got. Yep. Yeah, that was that was great. Um, I can add a little bit there, uh, if I may. Right. Please do. Um, uh, it's interesting when you look at that verse again, who Abraham... Abraham, against hope, believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken. So in other words, he believed against hope in the hope of what God spoke, that God said it, so it shall be. Um, and verse 19 really helps you understand what he's hoping against hope, the, the fact that and being not weak in faith, he wasn't weak in faith. He, he believed God. But <laughs> he considered, he didn't consider his own body, which was dead. In other words, he had no more ability to produce seed to make a baby. Okay? We all know how that works. When he was about 100 years old. So Abraham's body was physically unable to, it was impossible with man and was possible with God. Amen. And neither did he consider the deadness of Sarah's womb. So <laughs> she couldn't even carry a baby. Yeah. She, yeah. Could, she couldn't produce the, the second part to the, to the embryo Dang. to make a baby. Yeah. I'd like to read uh, read the next part because um, um, you jumped ahead, but I can understand why it was necessary to do that because 
my question about hope against hope and, and uh, that that phraseology uh it does make sense uh if we you know context is not just the verses preceding sometimes you've got to read a little further to get it so i'm going to read a little bit further and then yes. uh, point, the point that you're making steve is is correct so my question about how do I, am i supposed to understand that if i was a little more patient and better at studying the bible here and you know uh, I'm trying to answer the question before I get all the facts here. So let me read more. Um, I'll read verse. Um, uh, I'm going to read verses um, 19, 20 and 21. I'm going to read. I'm going to read that even 22. OK, so because that's the conclusion. Yes. OK, so it says, uh, and being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead when he was about 100 years old neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. So your point exactly right, that the, the reason this was such a, a great faith and it was hope against hope is, is because it, what God promised him would seem impossible. In verse 20, he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, like, come on, God, like Sarah actually did do that and then later on convinced him to, to doubt enough to have uh, relations with um uh, you know, um, Hagar, Hagar, the hand. Um, but uh, so he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was a able also to perform. And therefore, it was imputed to him for righteousness. I'll yeah. go first on this one, but it's, yeah, all of this, uh, this last few verses together, you can see that uh, who against hope uh, believed in hope is it's it, his faith was so spectacular. It really impressed God <laughs> because yeah. God promised him something that nobody should be even believe. Obviously, right. come on. He's talking about them being about 100 years old and, and yet uh, she's going to have a baby with him. I mean, that's impossible, but he believed him anyway. So that's why God was so impressed with his faith that he made this promise to him and said, uh, that's the reason God imputed him for righteousness, because it was such a great faith. Uh, let me get uh, Brother uh, Cripps's verse uh, 19 through can, 20. I'm going to cover can you all read that. that in the Amplified, uh, the same okay, verses? I'll read, I'll read 19 through 22 in the Amplified. Good idea. And it says... Um, Without becoming weak in faith, he considered his own body now as good as dead for producing children since he was about 100 years old, and he considered the deadness of Sarah's womb. But he did not doubt or waver in unbelief concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong and empowered by faith, giving glory to God, being fully convinced that God had the power to do what he had promised. Therefore, his faith was credited to him as righteousness, that is right standing with God. Praise God. Praise God. All right. I'll second that. Yes. All right. Okay. Crips, uh, I mean, I, I know usually we like to go a little more slowly, one verse at a time, but I think in, we had to put all the context of all that together. To well, I, really understand. I, I understand that. It's rolling up on 11 o'clock for me here. So that, that yeah. I totally get that. So um, I, uh, going back to verse 19, the first statements that me that's made, and we're hearing this from, from you know, Paul the writer, but we're hearing it from God, not and being not weak in faith. So he's making the statement here very, very clear that his faith wasn't weak, and we know that from the previous verses, you know, and hope against hope and all that uh, that we just went over. He didn't, so he considered not. He didn't even think about his own body, just as the brother Luke said. Uh, that you know now dead being being aged being aged being old uh, and also even though he didn't think about that he also wasn't even thinking about his wife's womb which was made clear so this is here it is again so Paul is making sure that everyone understands he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief unbelief was not a part of it at the, at, at the time it just wasn't there it didn't exist but was strong in faith. So his belief was very, very strong, was making that very clear as well. And the, here's, the, here's the next clincher is, this is the way we should all react 
in giving glory to God, all glory to God in the situation. And I, I just, I can feel what Abraham felt in just hearing that promise and knowing that it was impossible in his own, in his own body and how wonderful that must have felt for him. Um, okay, and then here it is. Here's the third time he's making he's making it clear that the audience understands. Being fully persuaded, Matthias would love to hear that just that one phrase. Being fully persuaded that what he'd promised, he was able to perform. Not he Abraham, but he God. He God would be able to perform it. What great faith he must have had to not have any of the same information that we we have. He didn't have all the things that we know. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. That's Amen. it. Make it short. All right. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm going to, I don't usually say this, but Brother Stephen, make any thoughts on that, but try to con bring it concise because we're going <laughs> to cover the last couple of verses before uh, we run out of time for Brother Cripps' bedtime. <clears throat> Oh, no, no. Don't make it be about me, man. I'm just saying uh, you usually don't go this long. So, you know, <laughs> I, I usually go. I usually go to a, um, actually normal time is uh, 930 to 11. Right. We start seven. So we'll go seven to 11. Usually gotcha. seven, no, 11. Hey, I'm just not like blaming. That. I just said, you know, I thought I'd... I'm making a joke, brother. Gosh. Well, I was joking at you. Yeah. I gave my joke <laughs> first. <laughs> and then you started punch with your joke. Nice. <laughs> That's the way it should be, Brother Luke. That's exactly okay, the way it should yeah. be. Steve, um, you probably don't have anything to say about this anyway. <laughs> probably not. I, I could say a couple words. Go, Steve. Okay, go, ahead. go ahead. Praise God. Praise God, indeed. Praise God, from whom all blessings flow. Mm. Praise him, oh. all creatures here below. Praise him uh, above. <laughs> okay. So, so, uh, but I do have some uh, short words on this. Oh, um, all right. I thought you wanted to go on to the next portion of scripture. Go ahead. Um, mm -hmm. Or just what we were just on. Um, you know, uh, I, I the the context there is, is, is important. I'm glad we did that to show um, how context helps you to understand. Like if, if you just let sometimes, you know, it, when you don't understand something, you know, uh, just like if you're reading a regular book and you don't understand a word, sometimes you don't have to uh, go grab the dictionary. You can use context of the sentence or the paragraph to help you understand the meaning of the word. And the same is, is the case uh, with the meaning of the word uh, and what Paul is writing. When, when we went on, it showed what Abraham was hoping against hope um and believed in hope the against hope was the natural the the that you know uh but neither abraham or sarah were viable candidates to produce offspring but god said you'll be the father of many nations and abraham's like okay you say it i got you I, i'm good i'm good with it I'm good, Vinny. I'm good. I'm 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 good with it. So I I, I believe you. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna trust you, and 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 it's so. Even though I can't tell how it's gonna happen, how you're gonna make it happen, but you're gonna make it happen, and I believe you. And that's why that that kind of of faith is the same faith Jesus talked about when he said to Thomas, "You be, you believe because you've seen." Amen. Greater are those who have not seen and yet still believe. And that's that's what Abraham did. He did not see yeah. in the natural, but he believed God in the spiritual of what God promised. And so because of that, he was he was fully persuaded. Like God said, I believe it. That's it. That settles it. Yeah. Yep. And therefore, because he did that. He got the righteousness of Christ before Christ died and rose again because the lamb was slain from the foundation of the world and the works are finished before the foundation of the world. Praise God. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, uh, let me let me just say because this particular portion of scripture I think can illustrate uh, why uh, I see things a little differently than some of our beloved brothers uh, regarding the subject of fully persuaded and and uh, ever doubting. Um, and here we have the idea of uh, the term. Um, where were we? Well, before you say anything, I'm probably more in agree agreement with you and what you're about to say. But just okay. you know. I, I would agree with yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. in, ver in verse 21, we see it phrased this way: it says, "And being fully persuaded." Uh, so uh, the the term "fully persuaded" means that he believed. You know, it's, it, fully persuaded means to believe. It means you have faith. We mm -hmm. can use a lot of words and terms interchangeably. Uh, sure. You're convinced. Uh, so here's someone who really believed, and God was so impressed with his faith that uh, uh, this he was declared righteous. Uh, but I know that not too far down the road, uh, <laughs> Era laughs at God's promise and then denies it when she's when God says, "Why are you laughing at?" She's, "Oh, no, nothing, nothing, nothing." But she's laughing about God's promise, and then. She even persuades her husband, well, we can't really, come on, are you serious? You really think we're going to have our own child? Now look how much we're old and we got older and still haven't had any children. I want you to have a relationship with my handmaid and that way we'll have a children. Well, that way we can, you know, have this uh, thing that God's talking about. We use hand, our handmaid. So they, she doubted. And then I believe Abraham doubted. Unless you want to believe that Abraham just gave in because he had a nagging wife and maybe he wanted to have sex with his handmaid. <laughs> you can rationalize it that way. But I think uh, Abraham was the stature of a man that he would have uh, not, um, if he continued to believe God's promise at that point and, he, and not doubted it, he would have said to Sarah, no, don't doubt God's promise. And uh, you know, just be patient. He'll keep his promise. But no, he had sex with the handmaid, and then we have this problem of uh, Ishmael and Ishmael's offspring becoming the you know the, the the two opposing sides in the Middle East. Still a problem today. Yes. Yep. You do have, it can be traced back to that mistake and those Ishmael and Isaac half brothers, and uh, each thinking they have the claim on all that land. Yep. So, uh, and that's because Sarah doubted. She convinced. Abraham, and I believe Abraham doubted. So uh, here's someone who was fully persuaded so much God was super impressed. And yet at some point, I believe that he did have a doubt of that the promise would be kept. Yeah. And yet no one questions whether uh, Abraham was truly saved at that point. Right. So uh, that's why I think this particular portion of scripture is important to understand that way. I, I think that there's other examples we could give too, uh, but I don't, I don't want to turn it into that a, a topical study on that subject. But that, that, that's why I do believe that it is possible for someone who's truly persuaded, they really do believe, and maybe they're a babe in Christ. And Abraham, we can't accuse him of that. But um, there are some people, though, that maybe they fall into the wrong church and they hadn't studied enough themselves, but they were truly persuaded. And and they uh, they believe, and yet they get fall into false teachings, and it fall into apostasy, or some tragic and tragedy in their life makes them angry at God, and finally not believe in God anymore because their family were all killed in a fire. I mean, there's all kinds of possible reasons why a person could end up having some doubt or lose their faith, and uh, I don't. I think that they there's a good chance that even people who are fully persuaded some, at some point could have those doubts. Um, okay, um, we got the last three verses here. Unless you want to expand on what I just said any further, we'll go to the last three verses. I think you you clear you uh, stated pretty well, and I would agree with you um, more than um, you know strongly in some other areas with other brothers. But the the beauty of it is is that um, you know we we stand together on the gospel, and that's what matters especially. But I think you uh, covered it pretty well. Yeah, and I only say it for those people who either do or ever had had doubts that to, to reassure them that that doesn't mean that you're not saved or didn't get saved, I don't think. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Okay. 
Now I'll read the last three verses together here. Uh, and uh, we'll ask, Can I uh, make one point on that real quick? Oh, yeah. yeah, please do. Um, that's why I love the verse in First Timothy, I believe. No, Second Timothy that says, even if we believe not, God abides faithful. He cannot deny himself. So if we have believed once and trusted like Abraham did once, and he's given us his imputed righteousness, he cannot deny what he's given. Mm -hmm. Because God is faithful, even when we are not. Yeah. And as we said earlier, we were asking about that past tense. I said, you said it's important to understand it's past tense. Yeah, once God declares it and once God promised it, it's as good as gold. It's, you know, let's say it's the Lord, it is written. So it's, it's, it's going to happen. Yeah. Amen. Um, all right. Let me ask Brother Cripps to talk about the last three verses. I'll read them now. Uh, I don't want to post them because there's too much. It won't accept this much at one time. So just listen carefully, Brother Cripps. Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also, to whom it shall be imputed. If we believe on him that raised up Jesus, our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. Brother Cripps? Yep, I've got here. So in being, uh, so... It wasn't just written for Abraham's sake. It was written for us all about the uh, imputed righteousness. And so we're under the same idea of what uh, the, the mechanism in which we receive this is by our own faith. Again, the word imputed he uses in both sentences, imputed to him. And in the second one, whom it shall be imputed. If we believe on him, belief is the mechanism. I've said it this whole this whole evening. It is the mechanism by the belief in uh, that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. So that we this is what we all stake our claim on. It's what Christ did and not anything else. Who was delivered for our offenses. Okay, that again is the sins that we've all committed. We uh, spoke earlier of all falling short and... Uh, what does all mean? It means all. That's all all means. So we've all fallen short uh, and was raised again for our justification. That's that's what we base everything on is the resurrection, raising Christ from the dead, and he's alive and lives evermore. It's the basis for everything. It's the basis of our faith, the resurrection. And the mechanism is the belief. We believe Therefore, is it is given to us. It's a gift that has already been given, even um, after the cross. It was already given a long time ago, and we're the we're the benefactors of it. And blessed are those that were born before the cross that uh, were not able to see it, but we're still blessed as well. We have a, plenty of information. Uh, there's no excuse for any any one of us that's living in this time. That's for sure. That's all. Mm -hmm. All right, Brother Steve. Yes. So, let me get my. All right. Uh, so, now so. it was not written for his sake alone, for Abraham's sake alone. What what Paul is talking about, what he's referencing in Genesis, was not written for Abraham's sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also to whom it shall be imputed. <clears throat> and and this, this, these two verses right here, talking about Genesis, the Old Testament that Paul is writing about for us, to us all that believe. Paul. Oh. All to whom it shall be imputed if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. And Jesus said, I have the power to lay my life down and raise it up again. So it's Jesus. 
who raised up himself from the dead. It's part of the Trinity thing that, you know, we, we're not going into that, but. <laughs> no. The fact is, Paul is writing about the, the Old Testament in Genesis, saying that that was not written for them, for him alone. It's for us, both Jew, both Gentile, anybody that believes on Jesus, that Jesus was raised from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and raised again for our justification. That Those, two, those verses, those three verses go directly against um, uh, dispensationalism, especially hyper-dispensationalism, because Paul is saying the Old Testament was written about the gospel for us today, for us to believe it, not just for him who was in the Old Testament, who was justified by faith, was given imputed righteousness, and there are several examples of, of people including David and others who were given imputed righteousness by faith. It's all over the Old Testament. And Paul is saying that wasn't just written for them. That wasn't just written for Abraham. It was written for us as well. Mm -hmm. Anybody that believes on Jesus, whether it was before the cross or after the cross, we believe he, he did accomplishment. They believed he would accomplish it. That's why we're given the imputed righteousness. That's it. Amen. Amen. And raised again for our justification. And justification means just as if I never sinned. Justified. That's right. Justified. And how are we justified, brother? By faith. By faith. By Amen. faith. Yep. Who's justified? Who can be justified? Anyone. All. By faith. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, let me ask. Um, we, we got through the whole chapter, and uh, it was wonderful. I appreciate your thoughts on all of this. It was very insightful by both of you. Awesome. Uh, we did have a request about an hour ago in the chat room, and I didn't, I delayed because I didn't want to get sidetracked. But there are some scriptures that someone asked if we would talk about for a moment. And if you don't mind taking 10 more minutes, if it's too late, that's okay. Just let me know. I'm good. I'm good as long as you're good. Jason? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm fine. Yeah. Okay. And th this is a request that Brother Chase made. And uh, he wants us to talk about these portion of scriptures. And I'll read it to you. And uh, it says, um, Luke 10, verse 38 through 42. Now it came to pass as they went, that he entered into a certain village and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was cumbered about much serving and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her therefore that she help me. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things, but one thing is needful. And Mary hath chosen that good part, which shall not be taken away from her. Uh, Brother, uh, Brother Cripps, why don't you go first? And I think I know why Brother Chase wants us to talk about it, but what do you get from that? What's the main, the main point that we should get from that those scriptures uh that it's that it's not works it's it's uh it's faith i mean if you really want to milk it down to the to the bottom line that's what it is and uh the service and and the acts and the works that we do is not as important as sitting at the foot of jesus and learning everything that he has to teach bottom line yeah brother steve um, yeah, I was just talking about this earlier today, <clears throat> and the, um, the confusion sometimes arises when we're talking about the gospel and that the gospel is by faith, no works, absolutely, Absol abs 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 absolutely, there is no work required, there is no work needed, you can't keep it, 
by do by doing works you can't earn it by doing works you can't do anything but believe and if you try to do anything but believe for your salvation you make it null and void we've established that paul later goes on in this book and i'm kind of jumping ahead in romans since we're in romans and i'm using that to reference this passage that chase is talking about um you know uh because we're saved we should walk in new lists of life we should do good works it's not that we cannot do works after salvation it's that we should be doing the works from that place of rest that we should our reliance is not on our works we work to glorify god and to further his kingdom and to grow his kingdom and to grow ourselves and the growing ourselves part comes from sitting at Jesus' feet. And the, the, you know, it's not only just that um, Mary was <laughs> sitting at Jesus' feet and Martha was doing all this works and, and not realizing that spending time with Jesus is the most important thing, and that's very true. But also the fact that Martha had a bad attitude about it. Had she been resting in Jesus while she was doing the work she wouldn't have cared that her that Mary was sit, sitting there just just resting at the feet of Jesus because I think that's what we need to do for uh, those who are babes in Christ allow them to rest while we rest and work from a place of rest that shows them how and we help them grow to where they can also help further God's kingdom and glorify his name in the earth. We're called to become more like Christ in the earth. That's not, does not have to do with my salvation. My eternal <clears throat> salvation is secure because of Christ. It has nothing to do with what I do. I'm trying to glorify God in the earth by trying to become more like Jesus so that others can see Jesus in me and want the same thing and want salvation. The old yeah. adage of preach the gospel, use words when necessary. Yeah. Amen. Well, and, and work from a place of rest isn't even work. Right. If you're able to rest in the finished work of Christ, anything that you do out of your gratitude for that cannot even be considered work. <clears throat> It is effortless. Out of your gratitude, anything that you do is effortless, and that's the way it should be, and that's the way it should feel. If we're able to do that, then everyone that sees our quote-unquote work will see that we're resting in him, in what work was finished at the cross. Uh, let, me, uh, let me say amen. I think you made the points that are correct and normally made, and what we're intended to get out of that. But I'm, I'm going to say something that uh, pertains to uh, the reason the question was just asked and to for everybody to consider this too. Um, we spend a lot of time being accused of, well, you're just giving people a license to sin. And we know that Paul argued against that. He said, God forbid, you know, as I think that's another pro, pro, pro sopopia that Paul says, hey, should you, give, should you um, sin more so that grace may abound? In other words, he's saying what he, the accusers are saying. And he's, no, God forbid. That's what the accusers are saying about us. But no, we're not saying that at all. Um, but let's take this, this portion of scriptures here with Martha, Mary, and Jesus. And let me ask. It says that... Uh, Mary, she, she was just sitting there and just being with Jesus and enjoying time with Jesus. But Mary was not sitting with Jesus smoking pot while she was with him. Mm. Mary was not with Jesus saying, hey, look at this magazine with pornography. Let's look at this together. Mary was, Mary was not doing all those things. She was just spending time with Jesus. 
So if someone is spending time with Jesus, it's like the verse that says that Paul talks about that. Hey, don't you know your body's the temple of God? And he talks about being with uh, with a, a committing adultery or fornication or something. And don't you realize your body's the temple of a Holy Spirit? What you're doing, you're dragging the Holy Spirit through your sin with you. And that's the same thing I'd like to introduce here. Yeah, we want to just rest in Jesus. But at the same time, while we're resting in Jesus, do we want to drag the Holy Spirit and Jesus through pornography and getting stoned or getting drunk or doing whatever our vices are? Imagine that. Picture mm -hmm. that. I don't think that's the way that what mm -hmm. we're supposed to get out of this portion of Scripture here, that we have the right to, okay, let's rest in Jesus, so therefore, let's get drunk, let's get stoned, let's, let's fornicate, let's do all these things, because that's... All Jesus wants us to do is just, you know, love him. Okay, any 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 response to that, guys? Uh, go ahead, Steve. Absolutely. Oh, Please. no, you can go ahead. No, no, you got it. <laughs> All right. You got it. Um, that's, the, that's the point. You know, um, Romans 12... One and two. Um, as a matter of fact, I'll, I'll if, if it'll go to Romans twelve. <laughs> um, but I'll go back one chapter to give some context on that. For him, and through him, and to him, him are all things. To whom be glory forever amen that's jesus so paul's talking about believing and all that as we've already seen in chapters in chapter four and i think romans 12 is very much a conclusionary for nearly the rest of of the book preceding i beseech you therefore i beg you that's what I beseech you. I, I beg you. I stand before you and beg you that therefore, because of what I said before, brethren, the saved people, by the mercies of God, that therefore it only comes before, it only comes through the mercy of God. That ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable service. <clears throat> this is to be reasonably expected of one who has been bought by Jesus. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may be able to prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So you want to know what God's will is for your life? <clears throat> start out by offering your body as a reasonable service to him and renewing your mind, conforming not to the pattern of the world, but to Christ's pattern. And only a saved believer that is sanctified, set apart, justified, sealed by the Holy Spirit, indwelt with the Holy Spirit, can do this. And you're not going to lose your salvation if you don't. But this is what we are supposed to do because it honors God back. It's saying thank you. But by, by trying to walk in the Spirit and live a life that is pleasing to God. And we do this by faith. Back to the whole faith thing. Even in our walk, we do it by faith. We try to do it in our own strength. Number one, it's not pleasing to God. And number two, it's it, it's it, you're not going to be able to to accomplish it in that in that manner without God's strength. And I'll leave it with this final uh, verse in Second Corinthians that I hope will explain this a little bit further. Second Corinthians chapter one, verse nine and ten. But we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, 
but in God, which raises, which raises the dead, who, God, who delivered us from so great a death, that's eternal life, and doth deliver, that's in our current present life. As we're, as we're walking in the spirit, he delivers us from evil. You know, um, he delivers us from sin and the addictions and, and the porn and the alcohol and the drugs. And in whom we trust that he will yet deliver us. So we have three promises here in, in verse 10 of deliverance. Number one, our salvation, our eternal security. Number two, that God will deliver us as, as we walk with him in, in this world, in our life, our, our, you know, positional, we have our positional sanctification, that's eternal life. We have our progressive sanctification, that's walking in the spirit. That's our walk with God, our reasonable service. Mm -hmm. And number three, our future total sanctification when our, when our justified and sanctified soul and spirit is joined with a justified, glorified, sanctified body that is in whom we trust that he will yet deliver us. That's future. So you got present, past, future, perfect tenses. All in one all in one verse. Three promises of deliverance mm. that all come from faith. The one in the middle is the one that we walk out. The one on on each end is what God does and promises to us that if we have that faith that at one time, like Abraham, we, we trust God completely of the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we trust that for our salvation alone. No works. We're good. Can't earn it. Can't unearn it. Mm. God, doesn't, uh, uh, God doesn't abort his children, and he doesn't, uh, he doesn't do that. So... Amen. Okay, um, let's. Um, uh, we've gone beyond uh, the normal time, so let's uh, take a minute now, just a minute each, and, and sum up your thoughts about the study. And uh, brother, brother Cripps, could, why don't you go ahead? All right, I'm going to talk fast. So uh, I'll play off of what Steve said about reasonable service. That is the key to everything. A, a person that is um, a child of God who understands the sacrifice that was given uh, for uh, he or she, in the reasonable service of their heart, they will not continue in a lifestyle where you're looking at the cross of Christ and you're saying, this means that I can do whatever I want. Also, in that same way, the spirit that we have inside us, though, will help us with the issues such as addictions, uh, drinking, and and whatever else. That So much so that we don't don't even have to focus on the sin itself. If we keep our eyes on Christ, we don't have to worry about living that sort of lifestyle. Holy Spirit helps us with that. So, and I would say to a person that is uh, looking at the cross of Christ and saying, this means that I can do whatever I want and still go to heaven, that I would seriously consider whether or not you're actually a child of his in the first place. Uh, as far as the study goes, the same points are made over and over and over again that is, that is by faith, and not uh, not of uh, the law, and um, I, I think Paul does a great job of summing summing that up, and I think that um, the the panel has has uh, in their uh, feeble attempts to interpret scripture because of the Holy Spirit have uh, kind of shored that up uh, pretty well. That's all. Okay. Well, uh, uh, Steve, I want to thank you for uh, helping us out tonight. Uh, you know, I thank you for having me. Uh, it, uh, it's a pleasure, and uh, uh, you know, you you were very helpful in, uh, in all your uh, your thoughts, and hopefully, uh, you know, we'll be able to join us again in the future. But I'm really still very concerned about Sister Renee, and I'm going to ask everybody to just. Double up on your prayers for Sister Renee. Please. I, all I can yes. tell you is that she is in extreme pain and she's suffering a lot. And she's all she's not only suffering from physical pain, she's she's suffering because she's very sensitive. 
her feelings are sensitive. And, and, and even in this state, in the hospital, some people are taking this opportunity to in, insult her. Some of the, some of the could, people, could I... they, they profess Christ and then want to insult someone who you know, hurt someone who, who's, who's in pain. So everybody just keep praying. Yes, Steve, you can you say that, but let's, everybody, please. Um, I hope, hope Renee's back with us soon, but right now she's in the hospital and it's, uh, so I just really appreciate your prayers. Amen. Um, Amen. And if anybody, you know, that <laughs> is saved, um, I think it would be great if we could all kind <clears> of <throat> um, come together and as many of us that, that can just go on, you know, whether you can text her or email her or put a comment on her most recent video, uh, you know, just, just put some encouraging comments in there, you know, that we appreciate you. We love you. Don't listen to them knuckleheads that are saying all that mean crap. It's not true. We love you. We know you're, you know, a true sister in Christ and we value what you do, you know, something like that. Be, be encouraging to her um, mm -hmm. as many of you that can and, and you know try to brighten her spirits in that way as well um, you know uh, that kind of pain I can't even comprehend mm -hmm. uh, the level of pain from what she's told me that she's in uh, I mean it's absolutely out of this world and and the fact that she's still trusting God and walking with God through it all you know and loving him through it is a testimony to me of, of the level of her faith, even mm. with people coming against her. So yeah, it's her reasonable grateful. service. Yeah, exactly. she would say she would say literally she would say that it's my reasonable service, and it is a testament. Amen. That's that makes the whole point of what I was saying. Yeah. That that shows Christ in the earth, and that's mm -hmm. what people want. Praise God. Hey, uh, but. Um... Hopefully uh, she'll be back uh, participating soon. And uh, but again, thanks again, Steve, for filling in, and Brother Cripps, thanks again for being here as usual on Wednesday. Yes, with me. And uh, uh, some of you may know that I started a Friday night program, and it's just interviewing all of the, uh, hopefully eventually, <clears throat> all of the saints all in our congregation, all the members of the congregation. If you're somebody who's uh, participating on a regular basis, uh, then, then I'd like to get to know you better. Uh, this coming Friday, I'm scheduled to interview our brother Leo Larson. He's been in the congregation for a couple of months now. And so <clears throat> I want everybody to learn more about brother Leo. Uh, so, okay. So Wednesday, Friday, and Sundays, uh, join us for these programs for the church of the eternally secure. And, uh, I can't remember, Brother Cripps. Did I give you a chance to say goodnight? I forgot. No, you didn't, but I'll just make it really quick. Uh, love you guys in the chat room. Uh, Kay Stover, I, uh, I still have about another half half an hour listening to your testimony, but so far, uh, great stuff. Thanks for having the courage to do that. Uh, what, a, what a testament it is uh, from your life as well. And uh, Stacy Cook, good to see you. Uh, everyone in the chat room, if I did um, didn't get a chance to chat uh, much in the room tonight. Just want to let you know that you guys uh, make this uh, possible. And uh, we're glad to have you. And uh, thanks again, Brother Luke, for letting me come on. It's always a pleasure, Steve, as always, brother. And uh, glad to hear about how things are going in your life. That That's a testament um, to uh, what the Holy Spirit does, uh, too, in the lives of those that love him. That's just a great thing. And uh, continue to pray for uh, Renee and uh, get get a message out to her if you can. Uh, right. Good night, everyone. Okay, thank you for everybody who's participated tonight, and bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus.